Well, uh, Dave, thank you so much uh, for that introduction, and uh, it was wonderful. My whole life flashed before my eyes. <laughs> um, thank you also for inviting me, and thanks for whoever arranged my schedule for the day. I had a wonderful time, and thank you to the people who met with me, and I heard some fabulous science, and thank you to the graduate students I met with, who are the happiest and most enthusiastic people I've met in a very long time. <laughs> in a phylogenetic screen. And Bastiani's lab was the mecca of the phylogenetic screen. And I think every person in this audience in particular is familiar with this approach in which you um, introduce mutations at random throughout the genome, and then by appropriate breeding schemes bring them from zygosity, examine the phenotypes that result, and look for the phenotypes of interest. But in this particular case, what we wanted to do was really isolate any um, mutation that affected the early development in a visible way. And this was a screen that uh, was initiated uh, well, really many years ago in Oregon, first by George Streisinger, later really developed to perfection by Yanni using chemical mutagens. But the problem with the chemical mutagen, of course, was if you do that, then every gene has to be cloned by positional cloning. That's very tedious. So we wanted to use insertion mutagenesis, which made the cloning much easier, particularly in a vertebrate organism. And, um, of course, that's a pretty big undertaking, and um, so we set out to first develop a method, then do a pilot screen with the method, and then do a large-scale screen with the method. And that entire endeavor took about a decade. But we finished it, and um, so I'm going to tell you the results of it, and the results of what with uh, some of the biological studies that are going on in my lab now that came out of this enormous project. But I thought I would begin at the beginning and actually review the technology, and what we found in a large way, what did we find as the genes we found, um, and then go into the more recent studies. This because of the picture that's shown here. If you're going to identify the genes that are essential for early development in a vertebrate, you better pick one where the phenotype is easy to see, and there is no more beautiful picture than this one of the early development of the zebrafish. And this shows the first five days, and this is about one hour after fertilization, where you form uh, the first cell has already cleaved to make four cells, and then you go through very rapid division. So by several hours, you have a couple of thousand cells sitting on top of this yolk, and then you go into uh, gastrulation. The cells come down as a sheet over the yolk and begin to gastrulate towards this. You see this thickening there. The sheet keeps pulling down over the yolk. And by um, 20 hours or so, by 10 hours, you can already see so much. By 20, you have this. The next morning, you have this embryo, which is wiggling its tail. And it's transparent. Every cell can really be tracked. Um, by five days of age, you have this free-swimming larva that has to be fed. So that's the end of the period that we're interested in. You don't want to have to stop feeding embryos. It's a beautiful organism in which to look for the genes essential for early development, and you could see many different body structures and organs, and in theory could identify uh, all of these genes. So, as I say, all we had to do was um, develop some technology. And after a number of trial and errors with quite a few different methods, everything we could think of at the time, and to many things, we ended up using um, retroviruses. And in fact, this was the field I had left behind, which was the study of mouse retroviruses and how they cause leukemia. And the viruses we use are, in fact, derived from mouse retroviruses, but they have a special property, which is that the envelope of the virus is not from the mouse leukemia virus, but from a completely unrelated virus called vesicular stomatitis virus. And it just turns out that the envelope protein of vesicular stomatitis virus is willing to become the envelope protein of a mouse retrovirus. So you get this, what's called a pseudotype particle. And the beauty of it is that this envelope confers the ability to infect the cells of essentially all species. And this phenomenon had been known for 20 years before we ever started to work with it. But what was hard about it was trying to um, develop uh, high titers of virus. And it took 20 years before people were able to grow very high titers of these uh, pseudotype viruses. And it was accomplished in the lab of Ted Friedman at UCSD. Um, and, um, and so when we heard about it, we thought, oh, that sounds promising. And in fact, it had been shown with, by him in collaboration with Wolfgang Grieven that these viruses could infect zebrafish cells. And retrovirus is obviously a terrific possible candidate for insertion mutagenesis because the virus is reverse transcribed, the DNA goes into the nucleus, and the virus integrates without perturbing the genome. Essentially, it makes a cut like a pair of scissors and inserts itself into the host uh, genome without 
messing up the DNA. And so it makes it very easy if the virus inserts in a gene to clone the adjacent gene by inverse PCR. And so this was a potentially very interesting um, thing that you could now make high titers of this virus, which had not been possible for the previous 20 years. So we uh, got some virus, and a postdoc in my lab at the time, Xu Lin, decided the way to try to get the virus into the germline, if you wanted to make mutations, of course, you had to get the virus to make these inserts in the cells that were going to become the future sperm and eggs of the fish, otherwise how do you get mutations? At the time we started the germline, yet the location of it in the embryo was not known. So the question was, how could you deliver virus into the germ cells of the fish? And Xu Lin did this experiment. I told him it couldn't possibly work, but it did. He was very smart enough, it wasn't he? And he uh, just injected a lot of liquid into embryos at about the 1 to 2,000 cell stage when the embryo sort of loosens up just before in the blastula type stage, and you can shoot a tremendous amount of liquid in among the cells. So we think the virus goes in among the cells and probably infects a huge number of cells in this embryo. At the time, we didn't know where the germ cells were, but a student in my lab, after the fact, discovered that the germline was even fish. And this is a picture that shows uh, what it looks like. You're looking down on top of the embryo at about the 1,000 cell stage over here. And there are four cells that have uh, screened with the probe to VASA, the gene VASA. And so here you can see that those, those four cells are going to become the future germline. On the next uh, slide, picture over, uh, to the right of it, there are about 15 or 20 cells um, as a result of the uh, duplication of these four cells. And it turns out every embryo has exactly four cells at this point. They become about 20, and then those cells are going to migrate into the embryonic gonad. So what happens is the virus must go into the embryo somehow around this stage, infect a lot of cells, including these cells, which then multiply. So you end up getting a uh, fish that is mosaic, transmitted to different progeny. So the experiment is you inject, and the, that fish goes